All right. Good morning. This is May 14th. This is your ESCA office hours. Um, and Ryan will start us off with some of the uh, important updates. All right, so FY25 ESCA applications. Uh, you should have by now seen that our preliminary allocations and estimates, uh, as well as equitable service amounts have all been posted to our website. And I suspect one of my teammates will likely be putting that link in the chat right now if you haven't seen them yet. Do check those out. Um, we do our best to double and triple check everything, but we are human. If you have any questions, always reach out to your regional program manager and we look, look into why your number is what it is. So the ESCA application for FY25 is going to be open for drafting on the 1st of June, and I should say by the 1st of June, though keep in mind you won't be able to submit it until we have final allocations that we get usually that first week of July. So you'll be open for drafting, you can ask questions, um, reach out to your regional program manager if you have any major issues, but there aren't a whole lot of systemic changes. Really, I don't think there are any real major changes in the application this year, some sort of minor text you'll see in a few boxes are slightly different. Keep in mind, um, as you're budgeting funds, when we get final allocations, sometimes those figures change, usually not dramatically, but it means that your allocation may go up slightly or may go down slightly, especially as we have some districts who refuse funds, we try to reallocate those. So your budgets will need to be adjusted uh, just a little bit when we get those final allocations in the system. And as kind of a word of warning, if you're an SAU that is going through any sort of reorganization, when you get a new school ID number, we create new schools in Grants for Me, even if it's still the same building with all the same folks in it. So if that applies to your district, you may not want to make those school level projects quite yet because you'll have to create new ones when those new schools are in the system. So just if you're one of those folks, you know, you know you're shifting grade levels enough that you're going to get a new school ID number, hold off on creating those school level projects. All right, as I mentioned, those equitable service amounts are available currently on our website. Uh, those percentages and those Title I amounts. Keep in mind, Title I amounts are just based on last year's while we calculate what's going to be happening this year for final allocation numbers. And this is the time of year where you as the ESEA coordinator are likely reaching out to your non-public school partners to really restart that ongoing consultation process. One of the only real major changes is to the application is we have changed that form we've used in the past to document that process. Uh, we debuted that form at our non-public school training and you can find all the resources from that training on our website. You can kind of see a screenshot here of where those are. And we also want to let folks know that this is a great time to check in on FY22. In FY22, we granted a lot of sort of carte blanche carryover for those non-public schools equitable services. And with only a few months left of availability for FY22, you want to check in as you're consulting about 25 and see, is there a plan for those funds to be spent down? And if not, potentially, could the non-public return access to those funds to your LEA so they can be spent before they expire? All right. Just going down the checklist of things we're sort of all on our to-do list right now, your annual comprehensive needs assessment update. We all know in the ESEA application, there's a page tied uh, right to updating your CNA. So every year you're supposed to get a group of stakeholders together. You look at your most recent data that you have and you update that CNA. And yes, you should be updating the actual physical or digital CNA that you have with that most recent data. And you document that in your application, you're creating um, new goals based on that data, you're identifying have your needs changed, and using all of that to craft your application. So this is just that time of year where if you haven't thought about it already, you're starting to get those stakeholders together to have those meetings. And lastly, the other sort of big time-based part of the ESCA application is the public comment period. So if you're relatively new to this process, every year you have to assemble an application development team. You create a plan for how you're going to use funds based on that CNA. And once you have that rough plan made, the public has to be given opportunity to comment on that plan. And if comments are submitted, you have to consider them in developing your final application. So this is that time of year where we need to give ample notice to folks. We can't tell them tomorrow that they have 
two days to comment on an application, for example. They have to be given kind of a reasonable amount of time. So I like to remind folks of this requirement. And one way we see that's really successful for a lot of SAUs is by putting this on a school board meeting each spring, maybe early June, when you have a good idea of what's going to be in your ESEA application. You know, your school board agenda is commonly always posted in the same place, so it counts as giving folks ample notice. Uh, we see some districts open public comment with the board meeting, and then on the agenda, let folks know right when the public comment period is going to end. And we also see folks close their public comment period with that board meeting. So they let folks know ahead of time they have until the end of that meeting, which already has a public comment period in it, right? All your school board meetings do. By the end of that meeting, public comment is closed, and then they can move on. We really want to make sure it isn't just, well, we posted it on our website. Right? That's not giving the public ample notice. They might not even know to look at your website for anything about your ESEA application. So I want to make sure we're giving ample notice, sending that out so folks know they have the right, because this is their federal tax dollars, to comment on the ESEA application. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to some Title I specific announcements, some quick ones. Uh, many of you may have seen the public notice on the main DOE newsroom website. Um, we are going to be for fiscal year 25 uh, convening as a Title I Committee of Practitioners. And we had a public notice go out um, that has a link also to the form and the invite um, that Jess will drop in here. Um, what's unique about the Title I COP that's different from an ESCA office hour, for instance, is that the goal and the sort of overarching objectives are to have a diverse group of role, diverse in roles um, in terms of all of those that uh, work with Title I students. So that can be teachers, school board reps, parents um, of students of Title I, either school wide or targeted, um, ed techs and other support personnel in your school, your school counselors, your social workers. Um, those that interface uh, with Title I programming and Title I students. So it uh, we will be meeting on Zoom just for ease and for geographic accessibility, at least at first. Um, and this group will grow um, in terms of being able to really uh, provide feedback to how we as a state implement the Title I programs, how we can improve processes. Um, this really is going to be kind of... Um, a, a collaborative group to solve some of our issues. So uh, we're excited about this. The deadline to at least fill out that initial form is June 7th. You can reach out to me if you have questions. My email will be on the next slide if you're not familiar with it. That is the Title I COP for next fiscal year. And then another, yeah, just an, ex I know I'm meeting with RSU 13 is moving to school wide. Very excited. Just want to shout you out. That's awesome. I always want folks to move to school wide. Um, so always, uh, if you're a targeted Title I programs, please reach out. We're happy to meet and talk about what it means to move to school wide, even if it's for future years. So the plans are due July 1, um, the application materials. It's the CNA with the school wide data. Um, this year, we are um, we want to make sure you guys have a lot of the data and analysis key. That's the key part to school wide plan is to know what your specific school needs versus just your district needs. So um, you know, use the ESCA dashboard by school if possible. Any of your other uh, data that you have locally, um, in order to paint a picture of your school and what your needs are and what your steps are, and that is all written in the guidance that we provide. That's on our website. It's on the resources page under Title I, and Jess probably um, stuck it into the chat. So uh, again, you can reach out to me if you have questions about applying for school-wide, and those are due July 1. And then last bit is, is just a, a fun um, update. Title I for summer reallocated this year, we were able to award just under $2 million to 56 districts across the state to run Title I, whether it's in targeted programs or school-wide programs. Um, and we did send out messages last week about how to, when you can begin obligating, um, what your fund codes are for your business managers and anything like that. So those questions also go to me. Um, uh, for Title I summer reallocated. But yes, we're really excited that uh, we were able to award funds again. 
where really um, some of the descriptions for the family engagement for some of the academic minded field trips were really wonderful. Um, and as we have in previous years, it's great when the performance report comes around and we can learn from all of the districts about really what initiatives and what strategies during summer has worked for your schools to keep your students engaged um, and excited to be at school. So thank you for all the work you do for this summer grant. We realize it's a whole other grant to apply for. Um, and we, I know your students, so we, your students probably appreciate it. And we do as well um, for the fact that you take the opportunity to do so. So thank you to all districts who applied and um, let me know if you have any questions. All right, we'll move on to fiscal corner with Tyra. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to review some of the upcoming uh, federal fiscal office hours. Um, the next one is going to be on May 30th from 10 to 11. In the featured topics are your written travel reimbursement policies, written procurement standards, and written conflict of interest policy. So please, if you do not have any of these policies in your district or for your schools, Tune in so that you can get some more information. These are required for federal funding. Next slide. <laughs> okay, budgeting and contracts. If you are planning for school year FY25, Please do not sign any contracts at this time unless you are planning on using your carryover from FY24 to uh, support the expenses for the contract. Um, if you have funds remaining in FY22 or FY23 tier three school improvement grant, they must be obligated for goods and service received by 9-30-24. So that's coming right up. So you, not, you do not want to enter into a contract and use these funds to support the expenses. Next. Okay, so some of you are getting grants for me errors. When completing the expenditure page in Grants for Me, you receive an error message as the amount you are entering exceeds what was budgeted for that object code. So um, the screenshot on the left side of the page in the little red box, it says what was budgeted, what has been requested, and what remains open. The only time that your negative amount for remaining open can exceed 10% of your allocation as if you are school-wide. The system does not um, put anything into the budget when it comes to school-wide. But if you are targeted assistance, you will get an error if you are trying to ask for more than what you have budgeted in that category. Um, Please don't just take that expense and throw it into a object code that you do have funds remaining. Um, I'm human and I do not catch everything, but um, if I do catch this, I will reject the, the invoice. You also will get um, errors if your application is open for a budget revision and hasn't been approved then those funds do not show up on the invoicing side until you have an approved uh, budget revision. If you have any questions, please reach out to me before, you know, taking your money or your expenses and throwing it into another object code. Next. So written policies and procedures, these are three the three major ones that we monitor for um, during our official monitoring season. And but I also request written travel reimbursement policies. If I see something that is questionable on your reimbursement request, um, it's one thing to have a written uh, policy. It's another thing to follow your own written policy. 
Um, so, so a lot of times I am testing to make sure that you are following your own policy. The, the written travel reimbursement policy, um, if you do not have your own, then it reverts to the federal government limits, which can be found at gsa.gov. However, with the procurement standards, whether it be um, the conflict of interest policy or your um, procurement limits. So in other words, up to $5,000, you don't need quotes, you know, or you want official bidding starting at 25,000 say. That's what the procurement um, standard policy is. The code of conduct is for your staff and um, it covers conflict of interest, receiving gifts and gratuities, and what happens if you discover that there is a conflict of interest or gifts were exchanged, what is the violation and what are the consequences um, for those. Again, you can um, tune in to the Federal Fiscal Office Hours. I'm gonna go into way more depth um, with my uh, federal partners here at the DOE. Um, Let's see. Uh, MSMA also has templates for those policies. If you decide to use a template from MSMA or a neighboring school district, please make sure that you are amending the language so that it says your school and not like the University of Louisiana in the policy when you're submitting it. <clears throat> Um, and Kathy, the codes are, the travel reimbursement policy is DKC, and the uh, code of conduct is DJH. Next slide. All right, this is just a reminder of what is coming up that is going to close. We do have an application in for a tidings amendment waiver um, for FY24, 23, 23, <laughs> FY23 funds. Um, and as soon as we hear back on that, we will go ahead and um, get that information out to you. But be mindful, there's a lot of money left um, on the table right now for FY23 Tier 3 School Improvement Funds um, and FY24 Tier 3 School Improvement Funds as well. There is a substantial amount for um, FY23 ESEA as well. All right, good morning, everyone. Just a couple of quick reminders to, to round out our morning here. Um, I am putting a link in chat for folks. So just a reminder, the Maine DOE does have a calendar um, of all sorts of different professional development opportunities being offered through the state. Um, so if you're in the process right now of maybe exploring some uh, summer PD options for your staff, uh, I recommend taking a look here and seeing what might be available at um, minimal or no cost um, to you and your staff. Um, you know, as as Tyra and Ryan indicated, um, we're also approaching a time where uh, funding for existing applications is gonna be coming to a close. We're also looking at new year funding for FY25. So um, again, be thinking about professional development and how you might wanna leverage some existing or new year funds to support that work. Also, um, for those who uh, may be somewhat new to their roles, we wanted to provide contact information for each of us. Um, we do essentially divvy up the state um, in terms of which members of our team work with what school districts um, in their uh, ESEA related uh, work. So if you're again, relatively new to your role or if you've been in your role for a number of years, 
Um, if you have any questions related to uh, anything we've talked about here today, um, anything as you begin working on your FY25 applications, uh, please do feel free to reach out to us. We're, um, we're available and we're, we're happy to help uh, act as thought partners or, or answer any questions that folks may have. And just lastly, um, here's some information on where you can uh, access some information for the department if you're so interested. Um, I will say that uh, some of the social media uh, pieces here um, are fairly worthwhile if, you, if you're interested in just kind of hearing more about what's going on um, around the state. A lot of what we put out is not necessarily specific to Maine DOE, but it, it highlights kind of what's going on in some, um, you know, other schools and communities across the state. So uh, if you're interested in learning from maybe some of your peers, I would recommend, um, you know, subscribing and, and taking a look at the publications that we offer. So with that,